Hello and welcome to episode 19 of the Court Right Cast, where we talk about films, stories, Hollywood, entertainment, news, culture, and everything in between. I'm your host, Alex Courtright, and I'm joined by my brother, Jonathan Courtright. And today we're talking about the Golden Globe nominations for 2021. Well, for movies in 2020, but the tw- yeah. 2021. You get it. As we all know, this is a bit of an interesting year for movies because... Let's face it, We, I want to be like excited, like, let's see the best movies, see what's going to win the awards. But in reality, it's a little bit underwhelming because you look at the list and there's there's like three movies. Yeah, they're stretching and really hard. Yeah, it just feels stuff. like it feels like the movies that are nominated are a bit of a stretch sometimes, you know, no disrespect to the films as well. And it, to, it, to it's be, clearly not what the list would have looked like had the year gone. Yeah, normally. It's, it's it's just kind of underwhelming. I honestly if, if the Golden Globes and Oscars, you know, all these award ceremonies weren't already falling off in their viewership and uh, the the esteemed reputation that they had this year might be a nail in the coffin, yeah. you know. And and now keep in mind, the Golden Globes are generally t- more TV focused. I mean, obviously there's film on there, but I tend to think of them as like more the TV awards. And I was not as interested in film this year or not film in TV shows this year as uh, film. And it was everything was so spread out across uh, the different platforms that it was hard to get to everything. Uh, some things kind of slipped through. And some things, there are some nominations on these lists that aren't even out yet. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, like uh, I saw Michelle Pfeiffer was nominated for French Exit. And to my knowledge, that movie comes out this month, February. Yeah, I don't want to sound like somebody that like (laughs) is just completely unaware of some of the movies on the list. But sometimes I was looking over them and I was like, where where is this? I've never even heard of some of these movies. And I'm like, is it because I live under a rock or is it because now to be fair, they aren't most yet? award, um, most of the time during award season, um, most movies released in theaters don't get um, like released to normal people until like January. Yeah. So that, that is, but also often. it's February. <laughs> yeah. So, but so today we're going to take a look at some of the major categories. I will say up front, we're not going to go over every single category we're not going to recap every single nomination for you we're just going to talk about some of the major categories and major films and tv shows actors actresses and kind of just our thoughts on the subject at large so for the first category obviously we have to come out with the big guns and talk about the best motion picture drama nominations and what did, what do you think of the nominations we got the father Mank, Nomadland, Promising Young Woman, and The Trial of the Chicago 7. Is it just me or does it feel like... I mean, when you're talking about a drama, often the movies that get nominated are some some of the films that kind of go un, get pushed under the rug during release seasons um, in favor of the blockbusters, but they usually get like theater extra theater releases or they go to a streaming service and get kind of promoted when the um, nomination season rolls around and that's kind of when those films get to shine. Mm -hmm. But I still feel like there's a very strong element of like completely and totally unknown movies on this list. Yeah. um, I heard a lot of good things about promising young woman, but I haven't seen it. Um, uh, Mank wasn't that good. Um, Yeah. I was kind of surprised the Mank actually, I think Mank has possibly the most nominations for films mm -hmm. on the list. I think because I think Gary Oldman got nominated for an acting yeah, award. Yeah, it's there's good things about the movie, and it's very it's very well made. Like I can see why it would get nominated for like a best director category. or best um, you know yeah best cinematography. Like, but those aren't even Golden Globe categories. Yeah, but uh, um, for best best motion picture drama, it feels like it's it's a very standard nomination. It's a movie that consists mostly of old white guys yelling at each other. <laughs> And it has tons of throwbacks to old Hollywood. So it's, v- it's a very standard nomination. Yeah, um, I could see that. Being that being said, it's directed by David Fincher. So it has that sort of esteem of being a David Fincher movie. But uh, yeah. I would be shocked if it won. The movie had a decent amount of hype around it um, when it came out. But in, it only just came out on streaming services. It had some decent like cinephile hype around it. But I didn't feel like it was a particularly mainstream film. And uh, I... I don't feel like it came into like 
soaring success. Yeah, and and the movie's not particularly accessible. It seems like, it like it's fairly underwhelming, and yeah, like people were not like, like jumping on it. I'm very familiar with what the movie's about, and I'm very familiar with Citizen Kane, and I'm very familiar with the with the stories around Citizen Kane, and the movie was really hard to get into. So for somebody who doesn't have much prior knowledge, I can't see them being interested in that movie whatsoever. Yeah. Like I said, I, I feel like it was already a cinephile movie. And then like the execution after it came out and the reception that it got seemed to confirm that, but even more so than I expected. Mm-hmm. Um, and now Trial of the Chicago, Trial of the Chicago 7, um, isn't that an Aaron Sorkin's movie? Yeah, Aaron Sorkin wrote and directed it. And um, it's... Uh, it's an Aaron Sorkin movie, and I love Aaron Sorkin movies, but I think I'm realizing I love when he writes for better directors, mm-hmm. because when he writes for somebody like Danny Boyle or David Fincher, with you get Steve Jobs and The Social Network, and then when he directs his own movies, you get Molly's Game and The Trial of Chicago 7, which are both good movies, but Steve Jobs and the social network are fantastic. Yeah. Movies. It's like, it's like what takes his films into the upper echelon is the collaboration yeah. with like visionary directors when he is putting that beautiful pin of his mm-hmm. <laughs> to the page because he's so good at the writing and has such a distinct voice and style. But I mean, the, the movies that he does on his own, they, they're, they're solid movies. Yeah, I've they're enjoyed solid movies, them. but, but the ones that he gives to really great directors are amazing movies. Yeah. The ones and, that you would just expect to just sweep the category. Yeah, and this in, was in very much like it hit every sort of Aaron Sorkin cliche. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, like there's these compilations of like they call them Sorkinisms. And they're his like lines that like keep recurring throughout like all his writing. Every single one of those lines is in Trial of really? Chicago 7. It's just like it is very much like. That's funny. I, I feel of, like I need um, to see that. If you're if you want an Aaron Sorkin movie, it is exactly what you'd yeah. expect from an Aaron Sorkin Can't movie. Can't go wrong. It's not a bad movie. It's a good movie, but it's not. It, it's disappointing when you see his other movies be so yeah. great. Also with Molly's Game and this one, like they're both like two and a half hours. It feels like um, he's very overindulgent um, when he's directing his own material. Mm-hmm. Whereas I feel like with Social Network and Steve Jobs, they're probably trimmed up a little bit. Or at least editing wise, well, do you, were cut down a little. Do you bit. feel like there's a connection between you know, not to say that he was like young and unproven at the time of doing Social Network or um, Steve Jobs by any means, but do you think there's an element of those being some of the earlier big films as opposed to now where he's got all the you know the check marks by his name? He wants to do whatever he wants to do, and he's know. getting more yes manned. You know, I, I don't know because I think he's had that for so long because West Wing and A Few Good Men were in the '90s and they were so successful. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like he's kind of had that for a while. I just think that uh, Steve Jobs and The Social Network and um, I'm blanking on the other one. There was another one. Moneyball. Moneyball was great mm-hmm. as well. Those movies were so tight and so like just um, like they were so um, dialogue based, but they were so compelling. Yeah. Um, so you think it's more just a matter of like keeping him on a shorter leash, maybe? Yeah, I think so. Also, this the story is it's based it's uh, based on a true story and the. True story is like really interesting, and um, I don't think it's a particularly well known story. Um, but it's it's a really interesting story. But the movie, the ending is really like I don't want to like give away like the ending yeah. or whatever, but it's a really like cliche tied up in a nice little bow at the end, mm-hmm. Hollywood ending, and it it comes off really cheesy and like almost. Like leave it leaves you on a bad note. Yeah, at least for me. Um, I don't know. I was disappointed in it because I expect so much from Aaron Sorkin. That being said, it's still totally watchable. It's still like an entertaining movie. It's got some really good performances. Um, but it's just, I don't know. I expect I expect yeah. more. Yeah. Overall, I mean, going back to the uh the nominations list, just it, if that's what we're looking at for Oscar season too, it just makes me a little bit like. <sighs> Not totally enthused. No. <laughs> Not enthused for best drama. 
In the next category, best performance by an actor in a motion picture drama, we have Riz Ahmed. I hope I didn't just butcher that name. I butcher all names. That's like it's going to be a running thing years from now. There will be a I'll be I'll be posting a compilation of every name that I've ever butchered and me saying I just butchered that name because I'm so self-conscious about it. But um, Riz Ahmed in The Sound of Metal, Chadwick Boseman in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Anthony Hopkins in The Father, Gary Oldman in Mank and Ta. Oh, God, here we go. Tahar Rahim. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. <laughs> you're like not you're not supporting me at all. You're like, yep, you d- you did mm. destroy that name. Uh, but that's from the even worse Mauritanian, the Mauritanian. I'm not going to lie. I've not, not heard of that film. Um, what did you think of Gary Oldman in the Mank? Though? Or I keep saying Mank, the Mank in Mank. <laughs> what do I think of his weird. performance? Yeah. And just in regards to like the nomination. Uh, he's good in it. Um. It's a, I feel like in, in the recent years, it's a very standard Gary Oldman performance. He's playing a real life character from the what, 40s, yeah. whatever. I mean, he just won for Darkest Hour. He's, I doubt he's going to win again. Yeah. Um, but it's he's a, on the roll. It's a good performance well, and it's, it's a pretty obvious nomination. And that does roll into uh, the, the elephant in the room being Chadwick Boseman's nomination. I mean, do you think there's any chance that Chadwick Boseman doesn't? win uh no i th- i think he's gonna win hands down uh if not him i'd say riz ahmed would win mm-hmm. um uh he's an incredible actor riz ahmed uh-huh. is um like i just watched the hbo series the night of which came out a few years ago mm-hmm. he's amazing oh yeah I've, I've seen some of and um i really want to see the sound of metal i heard it's really good and he's supposed to be great in it so. yeah but the, i think chadwick boseman's got yeah this the one. dilemma with chadwick boseman is that it's almost unfair. It's it's one of those things where y- you want him to be nominated, f- especially because, you know, he passed away in the past year or before this film came out. And I feel like it was really important to remember him and his performance. And I feel like it would just be awesome for him to win, mm-hmm. you know, in that year after he passes. Uh, not that for him or his family, like just getting an award is worth anything, but just to his legacy, yeah. you know, to really, if we're to really get that kind of recognition, I think would be really awesome. I think he definitely deserves it. Um, that being said, I feel like it's almost a little bit unfair to anyone else nominated because if I know, I, I say this from my perspective of like, if I was voting on the Golden Globes winners, I, I would not be able to separate Chadwick Boseman and me wanting him to win personally from the like utmost quality of the films that were nominated right. and, and the actors. So like, I, I feel like it's kind of a weird place to be where it's like, I feel like it's unfair to everyone else because how can you not go for a Chadwick Boseman? But then on the flip side, it's like, you can't, you can't not go for him. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I think he's going to win. I, I, I think he should win. So the next topic being best motion picture animated, we have the crudes, a new age onward, over the moon soul and wolf walkers now do you think i would be wrong in going ahead and assuming that soul and wolf walkers would be the two contenders for <laughs> for best animation is that just an opinion thing am i like projecting uh, my feelings no i think or, it's pretty obvious I, um, I don't and also i, th- I think i think soul is gonna win i i think soul um, wins too. I, th- I think if you ever put any animated movie against a pixar movie when it comes to awards the pixar one's always gonna win yeah um and personally, I think it should. Yeah, I, but, I actually would agree with that. Normally, but they're I two do, great options. Normally, I'm a little more partial to the the, I guess the lesser known film when it comes to the the, the nominations. Um, you know, I feel like Onward kind of just flew under the radar. I'm a little bit surprised about the nomination. Um, you know, I've heard of I've heard about the Crudes being solid, but I feel like this year it was kind of like they just threw up. Which they do every year. They just kind of threw up everything that was animated. Animated you know? category, you pretty much always know which one's going to win. Yeah. Like, I, I can't remember the last time I was wrong about an animated prediction. Mm-hmm. But I, I th- contrarily to in the past, like, I actually do really believe in Soul for, for Best Animated. Mm-hmm. Like, I really, really love Wolfwalkers and the the more almost indie uh, vibe of Wolfwalkers and Cartoon Saloon. You know, not kind of feels like they're going up against the giant that Pixar is. So mm-hmm. I hate to be like, and it goes to the corporate giant. Yeah. <laughs> but in this case. But also, this is the, this is the first time. Pixar's really knocked it out of the park in, in a few years. Yeah. At least to this extent. How long has it been? Do you, do you know off the top of your head since they won? Or the last movie that won? Uh, that they did? Oh, God. I can't, I can't remember. I Didn't Coco win? 
Probably. Probably. I, I feel like that I'm just thinking likely. back to all of them, just thinking like yeah. they pro- I, I'm I'm quite sure Inside Out what, one. Um was Coco the last like major, like big Pixar film that like really knocked it out of the park? I feel like we talked about this on I our think soul so. podcast. I feel like there was one in between that that I'm blanking on. No, no, I think it was Coco. I think Coco was the last one. Yeah. Um, so I I mean I think he's deserved this year. I think I think you can hand it away though. That being said, I would love for I mean, Wolf Walkers and anything that the Cartoon Saloon is doing, I, I'm very supportive of in them, in them Wolf- getting the win. And honestly, if Wolf Walkers did win over Soul by mm-hmm. some chance, I would be, it's, it's not like I'd Pixar is going to be like, oh, no, we didn't get our 15th Oscar. Yeah. yeah, I would definitely be happy with either of those two. Can't say I would expect anything from the others, though. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't I don't antis- anticipate any of the other ones yeah. having a chance but. For the next category, best performances by an actress in a supporting role in any motion picture, there is Glenn Close for Hillbilly Elegy, Olivia Coleman for The Father, Jodie Foster for the that weird movie with the name that I can't pronounce that starts with an M. <laughs> Have you heard that name? The Mar- Can I see how it's spelled? Maritanian? Mar- Maritanian? I feel like I'm making it worse by like trying to sound it out. Um, but Amanda Seyfried for Mank and Helena Zingle for News of the World. Um what do you think about the News of the World nomination? Uh, do you think it's a bit of a stretch? Or do you really think that's like... Dessert? I think it's a bit of a stretch, but she's good in it. I feel like it was more of like we didn't really have anything else to put yeah. here. I mean, it, she, she's good in it. But I mean, she was, was good not, in it, but it's not a... I was not blown away. No, it's not an Oscar performance. And I mean, uh, like Golden Gold for the, for, on the rest of the list, we have kind of, you know, Amanda Seyfried, Jodie Foster, Olivia Coleman. you know. Yeah. I mean, it, they probably did good. There's, yeah, they, they, they could go to any of them. It's just, it, it kind of feels like it's like, they just look, they're like, what was decent? <laughs> it's yeah. kind of like they're. Yeah. It, and that's how it feels. Like, for a uh, lot Amanda Seyfried, films. it's like she was good in it. I would never be like that was an award worthy performance. Did you just say Amanda Seyfried? Yeah. Is that how you Sorry, say no, her No, you name? said it wrong. I've, yeah. I've heard I didn't it. Stop not, I wasn't it's making Seyfried. that up. Seyfried. I've literally heard Amanda Seyfried my well, whole now you, life. Now you got me thinking I said it now wrong. Now I know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Let Seyfried. Let us know but, in the uh, comments. <laughs> or don't. Yeah, or just be nice about it. You don't have to say that we can't like pronounce anything. You're both right. <laughs> we're, we're both perfectly right. The next category, um, best performance by an actor in supporting role in any motion picture. You got Sacha Baron Cohen for The Trial of Chicago 7. Daniel Kaluuya. Kal- Kaluuya? Kalua, like the alcohol. <laughs> oh Daniel Kaluuya for Judas and the Black Priest. I, I love him. I yeah. I'm okay with once any again that movie hasn't. We just saw the trailer for it. Yeah, we we can't even watch that movie yet. As far as <laughs> I, I think, it comes out or like it. in a week or two. Yeah, it, it actually might be out or just come out. Maybe I feel like I just saw something about it. Anyway, Jared Leto for the Little Things, Bill Murray on the Rocks, and Leslie Odom Jr. for One Night in Miami. Um, Jared Leto, the Little Things. <sighs> I really like Jared Leto's performance in that. And, you know, Jared Leto is made a habit of appearing in these award ceremonies for uh, various roles, barring like Joker. <laughs> um, but is it me or does it feel I, I mean, I thought he did a really good job in little things. Correct. Like, I mean, he played yeah. someone that is supposedly a serial killer who like murders women. And it was incredibly creepy, um, unsettling, gripping all the scenes that he was in. That being said, at what point I do, and this might be just like a skeptical, like way too critical take, but at what point do we get tired or do we stop hailing the gimmick performances? Well, it's also the, it was the exact same performance that he gave in Blade Runner. Yeah, yeah. Like like, to a T, completely different characters in the exact same performance. I like the performance. I I, I, I don't want to knock Jared Leto by any means. For his performance, but when you come to the nominations, I and this this goes for all actors that do that, whether I like their performances or not. I feel like the creepy or super. I just feel like there's not. It's all one note. It's very not dynamic, and it's like at one at what point do we go? Okay, you can play a very creepy guy. Well, and then just move on. Like we we hand out these awards or nominations to these and it's not just Jared Leto it's you know any of the common actors who can play that role well we love to see them it's not that they don't do a great job it's just that when it comes to you know supporting actors I tend to lean towards people that have a broader range of dynamic Mm -hmm. and I feel like while it's a good gimmick it's well done and that's what you need for a film like Little Things I 
Jared Leto played the same scene over and over in the film. Like he did yeah, the same thing in every scene. I think it's just that it's a very obvious, it's a very obvious performance. Um, and the casting for it is very like, like, oh, we need a guy who's creepy and looks like he's homeless. Uh, see if Jared Leto's available. <laughs> yeah. It was very much just like, it's a very obvious performance, very obvious casting. It wasn't something particularly inspired or profound. Like yeah. it was, I mean, he, 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 did, he a did a job. good job. He did a good job. Did, I yeah. enjoyed every part that he was in in the film. It was it was nice to see him in a film that I personally enjoyed to begin with. But I was just it, it when I see these performances pop up on the nomination list, I just have yeah. to wonder. No, the, this one this one's a bit of a stretch. I, I guarantee you, if all the movies that were supposed to come out last year had come out and the release schedule had been normal. He wouldn't be nowhere on the nomination list. Uh, I would have, now. It. I don't know if it would have counted as a supporting actor uh, in the, for the category. But if we're just talking nominations in general, before I would nominate someone like Jared Leto for that performance, I would have nominated Rami Malek or even oh, really? Denzel for that for for that film. If we're talking anyone from that film or from just a film that I really enjoyed in 2020, I mean, I'm not saying that they were the best performances of the year. But if we're stretching and we don't have a lot to choose from i thought that those performances were more dynamic yeah. more broad broad jared Leto's more showy though yeah and, and that's what kind of i guess that's what it just kind of bothers me a little bit that the the the, the nominations often go to the the gimmicky characters yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really i personally just really look for the dynamic broad range of uh, abilities from the actors but now for the next couple of categories they kind of blend together because we're doing best picture as well as best screenplay for best picture we have a lot of uh, re- i guess return nominations so uh, they kind of blend together but we got here we go again with the names em- emerald Fennell. A promising young woman, David Fincher, Mank, Regina King, One Night in Miami. I didn't. She did not know she did. Uh, she directed that. Hmm. Aaron Sorkin, The Trial of Chicago Seven, and Chloe Zhao for Nomadland. I'm pretty sure earlier I said Aaron Sorkin's by accident, and now I'm just like thinking about how I'm gonna get like roasted. <laughs> I just I can't do the names. <laughs> it's like I can read them. I'm so used to reading them and not having to say them, and then I'm like, oh, I. I don't even know where to go with that, but um, that that was best motion picture, best director, and uh, best screenplay is pretty much almost all the same things. We got No Man Land, Trial of the Chicago Seven, Mank, Promising Young Woman, and I think the only difference is the father with Florian Zeller and Christopher Hampton. Hmm. So you know, a lot of those returns from I think a lot of those were from the best picture too nomination. Yeah. So you know, it's. It becomes a toss up. You get into technical categories there. Um, the next category, which I think is a relatively interesting one, is uh, best original score, where we have Alexandre. Alexandre, is that how you say? It? That's not Alexandra. It's Alexander, but Dre at the end. Alexandre. Is that how you would say that? This entire thing just Alexandre becomes like a pronunciation. Yeah, <laughs> spelling. I'm just gonna say <laughs> the uh, the films, the Midnight Sky. Uh, Tenet, News of the World, Mank, and John Baptiste Soul. Um, mm. News of the World, interesting choice. Did you did you, did you find the News of the World uh, uh, original score to be particularly gripping or noteworthy? No, I remember thinking it was good. I want to say I said something about it in the podcast that we did. It's good, but it's not award worthy. I was yeah, I was not um, like, but it also takes a lot to uh, to be kind of blown away by a score. And I'm not gonna lie, this is where a bit of my um bias might come in i i would absolutely give it to tenant uh based on the options here i'd give it to soul soul's not you said it's not on there or is it is, is i it thought jo- you said soul. is it soul it says trent reznor atticus rose john baptiste mm-hmm. the way it's labeled on this i'm on the golden globes website so this is the official website yeah. um it, the names are in bold and underlined and John Baptiste is not in bold and underlined. So it made it seem like it was John Baptiste's soul. But that actually makes sense if it is Pixar's yeah, cause, cause, uh, soul. Yeah, no, it is because uh, Trent Reznor that makes, and the that other guy sense. did did the could, did part of it. And then the other guy no, did the I jazz remember stuff. that now. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I did really enjoy the soul soundtrack. I do love I have a I have a problem with loving uh, Christopher Nolan's sound editing which kind of bleeds into the soundtrack heavily. So uh, maybe I'm just a little bit partial on that, but um, I, I would, it would be between Tenet and Soul for me, but I did really enjoy Soul. I will say I'm not a big fan of Trent Reznor soundtracks. So I feel like I'm a little bit biased in that direction too, of 
Like, I, th- I thought it worked really well. What they Soul. did in Soul worked really well, but I typically don't love Trent Reznor's style of soundtrack. But um, but yeah, I mean, between the two, I I, I do think. I mean, I, I can definitely understand Mank. Trent Reznor was on Mank too, and Atticus Frost. Both of them were the yeah. The Mank uh, soundtrack Soul. was good. And, yeah. Uh, so I mean, some great options here. I, I haven't listened to the soundtrack to Midnight Sky, but the that that name that you were trying to pronounce, I think he does. He does most of Wes Anderson's movies, so like Isle of Dogs, I think was one. Oh, okay, of them. and and he his soundtracks are always great. Yeah, but. so that's actually a pretty that's that might be that might be one of the strongest lists of nominations though of the yeah, uh, of yeah no, this that's year so list. far. Like, like that's the only time I haven't been like questioning uh, the the nominations. Like you were kind of stretching here. Like all those are seem like really strong choices. Now moving into the television categories, we are going to kind of gloss over these a bit because we don't follow that much television and quite frankly i'm not super excited or happy with a lot of these nominations and then obviously uh, a lot of the nominations are really obvious can we just announce the winners um <laughs> queen's queen's gambit queen's gambit queen's yeah gambit and queen's i gambit? kind of expect a lot of queen's Ban- queen's gambit when it comes to the winnings um you know best television series was the crown lovecraft country mandalorian ozark and uh ratchet ratchet rat it's not yeah, rat- rat- ratchet That's- ratchet yeah. I read I want to read it like ratchet, yeah. <laughs> like with a T. Um, the crown is always showing up. I feel like the crown is always showing up. Lovecraft Country. I tried that show. Not a, not a fan, but I know that some people kind of like that. It honestly seemed like a bit of a throwaway show. Um, Ozark. Honestly, I have not seen Ratchet, but uh, uh, I am familiar with everything else on the list. Ozark would be the one that I really, really enjoyed. I honestly forgot that Ozark even came out last year because it must have come out come out like super early um the last season of it but I did really enjoy last season it wasn't as good as the other seasons though just to be clear but um Jason Bateman as well as like I think at least two other actors or actresses from Ozark got um nominations which we'll talk about in just a minute um the big the big one on this one this list that I have to speak out about is the Mandalorian on Disney plus being nominated for a best television series and I guess if they're just looking at who's watching the shows, maybe you could just be like, we have to nominate the Mandalorian because, you know, it's just really popular. This is like one of the most popular TV shows. It gets a lot of press. That being said, I have to stamp a hard no on that nomination. I wouldn't even nominate it. And there's there's our hot take for the podcast. If there's anything. Hey, don't trick me into this. I didn't watch the Mandalorian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you didn't watch the Mandalorian because they're. I told you you didn't need to. <laughs> there well, was I no mean, reason to. I, I was on that early. Episode. I stopped watching the first I season. I watched every episode of both seasons of The Mandalorian, and the show is poorly written. It is fun, Star Wars, at some points in time. But it Shut is up, man. It's fan service. It is a poorly written fan service show that fizzles on almost every account and has a horribly written script. You're just wrong. <laughs> there are some things that I enjoy about it. I am telling you right now, I will probably be here for season three or whatever the next season is because... I am that person that will check out the new Star Wars thing no matter what, even if I dislike it. But I have to say, come, like, just don't bring it into awards. I love Star Wars to death, but there's not. Is there a single Star Wars movie that we should or a Star Wars entity that we should bring into the awards ceremonies when it comes to on screen, like not counting games? I guess maybe you could say like Clone Wars animated. If it was like animated TV show, you could have said that it probably could have gotten to awards. Maybe. I don't know. I'm stretching here. But like, at what point do we start bringing like these Star Wars IPs into the awards ceremonies. I don't know. Anyway, moving on into um, best performances by an actress in a television drama. Um, Jodie Comer for Killing Eve, Olivia Coleman, The Crown, Emma Corinne for The Crown, Laura Linney for Ozark. That was the one I was mentioning. Uh, plays Jason Bateman's wife. I forgot her name in the actual show. Um, and Sarah, Par- Sarah Paulson for Ratched. Um, not actually that big of a fan of the Laura Linney even though I really love Ozark and I guess all the performances are really good that her character is really grating and I guess she acts it very well. But I feel like at some point we're just naming the popular shows, right? Like like the esteemed dramas. Uh, but um, skimming a little bit past this best performance by an actor in a television series, um, Jason Bateman for Ozark, Josh O'Connor for The Crown, Bob Odenkirk for Better Call Saul, Al Pacino for Hunters, uh, Matthew Riss for Perry Mason. Um, Jason Bateman for Ozark, like I said, I, I don't know that I would just like throw the award his way. I can definitely see the nomination, though. He 
I I always like Jason Bateman, but I'm not like a massive fan. Ozark makes me like I love him. Like yeah, I he, really enjoy. He was his amazing in um, The Outsider, which also came out last year. Oh yeah, kind of surprised it didn't get anything so far. Yeah, I I really enjoy his performances, and Ozark really kind of after these. I think we're like see, three seasons in. I, he's really won me over. I'm not a big fan of Bob Odenkirk, and I honestly I don't understand the Better Call Saul love. Just because I feel like I've never seen him in that, but everything that I've everything that I have seen him in, he's always been really good. I just feel like the spinoff just doesn't really live up. But uh, best television series in the next uh, category for musical or comedy. Emily in Paris, The Flight Attendant, The Great, Schitt's Creek. That's an awkward one. Dang it. Never. This episode will never be monetized. (laughs) Hey, hey, spell it it's it's spelled with the c okay <laughs> shit's creek dead lasso uh for the final one i i'm gonna be honest i don't watch musicals or comedies so i'm not gonna comment on those uh nominations um best television limited series anthology series or motion picture made for television we got the normal people from hulu netflix's the, the queen's gambit small acts from amazon studios the undoing from hbo and unorthodox from netflix and, uh, I mean, you haven't even watched Queen's Gambit, have you? No. But you know that King's Gambit I just King's know Gambit how popular win, it right? is. Yeah. It's gonna um, I, I do, Unorthodox is really good, too. Um, but I, I cannot see a world in which the Queen's Gambit doesn't win. And that's not because I love the Queen's Gambit. I have not even finished the show. I watched a majority of it. It's a good show. It's it's, it's well done. It's well acted. But it's I do think it's, a, it's kind of heavily overrated. But as a chess I, I fan, to watch, too, I really enjoy watching it. I want it. to watch it. I like both the... Um, like lead actors, Anya yeah. Taylor Joy and uh, uh, Thomas boy. Broder. Yeah, Sangster. He's not in it as much until like I guess later on. He's kind of in and out of it, but it's it is good. It's I'm one of those people though too where I see like extreme hype for something, and I'm just like, I ca- is I, it as good? as I they didn't say watch it, is? it yet be- because of that. Like I yeah. didn't like I heard so much like praise about it, and it looked good. Um, and uh, I wanted to see it. But I was like, I, I want to wait for the hype to die down a bit. So yeah, it's I think it's worth a watch. It's it's a good series. Um, but just based on the hype around it, the, the series just blew up. And so I really expect that to take it away. So that covers most of the major categories or uh, ones that might be relevant to this podcast and some of the films we've seen, haven't seen, enjoyed or haven't enjoyed. But I think one of the interesting things to take note of that is a... Uh, I don't know how I feel about this is really the um, the ratios of nominations in that uh, motion picture distributors. Netflix took the cake with 22 nominations this year. Um, Amazon Studio in second with seven. Mm. Like Amazon dominated these nominations. Yeah. Uh, You mean Netflix did? Amazon. Did I say Amazon? Yeah. Netflix. (laughs) Netflix really dominated the uh, nominations. They also uh, for television distributors like that was for motion pictures. Now, for nominations by television distributors, they had 20 HBO had seven in second place. Like now, and I understand that you don't you're not going to expect like Hulu actually had six, which is pretty good considering no one like does anyone even have Hulu anymore? (laughs) um, Amazon only three shows. Showtime took away five pop TV got five. I've never even heard of pop TV. Um. But Netflix just absolutely sweeping these awards across the board was just crazy. And then the the highest uh, amount of nominations by motion picture was Mank, which was six How many? Uh, no. with six nomina- nominations. The Trial of Chicago well, Seven had five, so it's really yeah. Close between those, those like. were both Netflix movies. So between those, that knocks out most of Netflix's yeah, nominations. Wow, yeah. Netflix just scooped up everything um, this year, and that's really why I bring up the. Um, the chart of nominations because Netflix, this was really just the year of Netflix, and uh, you know with the with the quarantine and how popular streaming already was, and how it really just sent so many movies to Netflix. It's it, it's just really baffling that they were able to take such a such a large portion of the pie. However, I can't say that I'm a huge fan of it because you know we've talked about streaming services and not to get into the streaming services debate again but the netflix has a real quality problem (laughs) is something that i'm 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 figuring out when 
it comes to, you know, I do think a lot of their the nominations that Netflix was a part of were fairly deserved. And, you know, I won't comment on the ones that I didn't see. However, it's it, it it's just crazy to me how much. They put out so much and to put this uh, eloquently, they put out a whole lot of garbage. Yeah. And then like five of them are really big hits and people are like, Netflix is really doing great. And it's like I've watched the past like four Netflix original films to come out and they were painful to watch. Yeah. It's it's, it's, just, it's just crazy how they pick things up because on one on one hand, what's it? You know, didn't Netflix get the Irishman? Yeah. And then Netflix also had like they they've had they've had some good stuff. They 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 picked like up they some had, big movies. They had like Marriage Story. And, what I can't and figure out the is Irishman last year. But. The films that they I guess uh, they take on themselves that they produce that Netflix produces kind of yeah. in house versus the movies that they just buy. Well, they're starting to like sign people on um, for like Netflix deals. Essentially, like I know uh, Noah Baumbach who uh, wrote and directed Marriage Story, and um, he's a, he's a really great. Um, director um and they they just signed some contract with him to where like everything that he does from now on is going straight to netflix oh really yeah that's yeah and he's he already did a couple netflix originals but uh but now like basically everything he does is going to go straight to netflix Hmm. which i guess makes sense for him because his movies were never going to be like box office hits they were like a lot smaller movies but but yeah netflix is starting to like scoop people or just like scoop directors up it's just i cannot understand i mean i guess it makes sense when you have a big uh, you know, a big company like Netflix, you can't expect everything they do to be good. I like. I think it's unfair to say that, you know, why can't they put out everything that's great? That being said, I watch Netflix movies and I, you know, when, when you look at the industry of uh, screenwriting and or writing in general and y- you hear about how hard it is to make it in, in the film industry at all, and then you see some of the films that get allowed to be made, that get handed money, it just doesn't compute in my in my brain um specifically you know not to name every single netflix film because there are some they they put out some decent films then they they buy some really great films and then there's also just a pile of just some of the worst things that i've seen just completely and totally incompetently made on every level types of films that that come out and it just it it always it's so weird because it doesn't compute because you know if you look at a service like HBO you know not everything that they do is great but they they do have they've always kind of had a bar for quality yeah the HBO name people sort of um, people sort of get the idea that it's going to be a quality product yeah. based on that well, I don't get that from a Netflix uh, yeah, sometimes well, it's sort of like a it's a toss no up. yeah it might, it might be good it might be bad up. Netflix is the you know it's not the high end it's not the low end it's just that everyone has it type yeah. of uh, streaming service because. You know, you go to HBO and I can see a, a series on HBO. And if I like the premise of it, I can probably expect it to be pretty cool. But on Netflix, you can turn something on and it can be like the hit new show that's ranking in the top 10 trending. And it's like, what? Uh, like not to name all of them, but specifically I watched uh, Anthony Mackie's Outside the Wire, which was one of the first films, I think, of 2021 to come out for Netflix. It's just one of the most incompetently written stories it, it, it a decently entertaining uh I mean, it wasn't really entertaining. It just didn't make any sense. Like the story didn't make any sense. The script was awkward. It was off. A lot of the acting was bad. It was like, who greenlit this as like one of your poster boy movies? Because then it was like, it was this big new, like new Anthony Mackie action uh, superstar movie. You know, same thing goes back to it wasn't Extinction, uh, a Netflix movie as well. Extraction or ex- extinction extraction. There isn't a yeah, movie the, called the, Extinction. The Chris Hemsworth, John Wick. Movie. Yeah, but the, yeah, the Chris Hemsworth, John wake movie which was entertaining i enjoyed chris hemsworth in it uh that was last year i believe wasn't Mm -hmm. um i i enjoyed that movie actually i say that you know to mention it in the bad movies it wasn't a bad movie but it also wasn't very well written it was very much like interesting because chris hemsworth did some cool things physically to beat people up like to to, like it wasn't an original film which not all films have to be but it also wasn't particularly well written it wasn't it was like the, the level of competence or you know, just the bar for films on Netflix is so much lower than you would expect from a theater release. Did you watch the new um, John David Washington uh, Zendaya. Zendaya movie? No, I was literally I wanted looking to see at that. it last night. I was we were, we were talked about it. Um, another one <laughs> I tried out. Go, you know, going over to the TV shows. You know, you get the Stranger Things uh, shows. Great. Um, you know, limited series uh, Queen's Gambit. Arguably, fairly fairly high bar. Um, and then you also get like Cobra Kai, like couldn't watch more than 10 minutes of it because oh, it was really? so cringe people like so that show goofy. a lot 
truly like painful to watch. I made it through 20 minutes. People love that show. Don't know how. <laughs> Lead actor within the first 15 minutes can't pull off a single line of dialogue. <laughs> like, yeah, it's just it, and I say that just to highlight like the broad scope of just the quality that you get from Netflix. And I wish that if we're going to move towards, you know, I don't want to move towards getting a lot of our uh, entertainment from streaming services. But as it is clearly moving that way, it's like, can we at least like, you know, like you said, hiring the guy that did a marriage story to do all of his films on Netflix or, you know, I don't want to take films away from the theater. But can we at least like start really like upping the bar for streaming services? And maybe Mm -hmm. that's a transitional period that we're in. Maybe we're in that period where it was hard to get these big directors to come to Netflix, but now the money is there and the quality will start going. However, with Netflix's like 70 some movie release schedule for the year and opening it up with Anthony Mackie's outside the wire. There was another film that I watched that was like just a Netflix original, like kind of action flick within the past few months. I can't remember it for the life of me. I'm not going to look it up, but the old guard, the old guard was good. I actually enjoy, or it wasn't amazing, but I enjoyed it for like a TV film. Um, but yeah, it's just it's, it's so unpredictable, I guess, is the thing. And I wish that I wish it wasn't, I guess. But that pretty much, I mean, wraps up most of my thoughts on the nominations. You know, like we said, it's a little bit underwhelming. Some good films, but underwhelming across the board. A lot of streaming services, which, you know, oh, well, what can you do? Can't complain, but so much couldn't get to the theater. Hopefully next year, hopefully next year, everything that was supposed to get released this year or in 2020, I say next year, hopefully 2021 has all the films that we were supposed to get in 2020 and the next uh, Oscar and Golden Globe season is just a blowout of it is going to be bizarre worth of films. All these movies that were supposed to come out in 2020 getting backed up to 2021. Yeah. Like you think about, you know, if no time to die ever comes out, I just hope they do come out. Um, That's the thing. I hope that they come out and we get, I hope that it turns 2021 into a massive year for movies, at least in just the quality of movies and how many we get. Just think about the release schedule though. Like I I know Dan, I don't think Daniel Craig's doing another bond movie, but um, if, if another one was supposed to come out, this one's already coming out like a whole year. Yeah. Like everything's backed up. Everything's backed up. Yeah. You think about like Marvel's release schedule. It shifts. Oh, it had to ruin Marvel's release schedule. Whole schedule. schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Just, it'll be interesting. And I, I really hope I really hope that after we get through, you know, the dead months of uh, 2021, you know, January, February, March, um, once we get to those April, May films, summer blockbusters, uh, you know, the more uh, probably expectedly critically acclaimed films that we were we've been waiting on that we can get a we can make up for all of the lost time <laughs> and uh, lost movies of 2020. But we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to the channel. And we will see you guys in the next episode next week. 